intro for those of you joining us for the first time. Uh, Science for Georgia started about three years ago. Um, we're a nonprofit focused on bringing scientists and the community closer together. So we do that in three ways. We teach scientists how to communicate. Um, we provide uh, venues like this and um, speaking venues so that scientists can interact with the outside world. And then uh, finally, we provide proactive and positive ways that scientists can engage with the greater public and advocate for the use of responsible science. So we're super excited that y'all could join us for this special edition. Um, the best way to participate in your democracy is to talk to the people that represent you at the state, local, and US level. Um, so we're pleased to have uh, four members of the Georgia General Assembly here. Um, the General Assembly is in session from January through the very beginning of April of every year. So we're super excited that they could take time out of their very busy schedules right now. Um, there's about three weeks left before they adjourn and they're all having a really crazy time right now. So we really like to thank them. Uh, we've got Senator Kate Kirkpatrick, Senator Jen Jordan, uh, Representative Jasmine Clark and Representative Eric Allen. So. The format of this is I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves and tell a story about a positive interaction that they had with a constituent and then we'll dive into the questions that y'all submitted to us beforehand. So thank you everyone who filled out the form and submitted questions. I'm going to start with Senator Kay Kirkpatrick um, and she is from District 32. Take it away, Senator. Hi everyone, Kay Kirkpatrick here. District 32 is uh, North Metro, it's uh, East Cobb and Sandy Springs. And I've been in the legislature for four years and prior to that was a practicing orthopedic hand surgeon for 30 years. So I uh, have started another career, sort of accidentally, but uh, I'm getting some stuff done. And I wanted to talk a little bit about an interaction that I've been having with a Girl Scout troop and it has to do with vaping education in our school system. And the Girl Scouts came up with a bunch of ideas and I've been working with them along with uh, Representative Bonnie Rich about the best way to move the needle. And what we ended up with was House Bill 287, which actually um, includes vaping as well as alcohol and tobacco in our education and our health classes. So. That is uh, coming over to the Senate, going through committee. I'm optimistic that it won't have opposition, but that all started with some girls who wanted to make a difference, and it's been great for them to track a bill through the process. So uh, the only other thing I'll add is that I am a physician. My husband's a physician. My son's an engineer. My daughter's an architect, and we all understand that it's very important for scientists to be able to communicate their ideas whether they're trying to get grant money, trying to get a bill passed, or generally just pitch their idea. So I congratulate you all on putting this on. It's very important work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. All right. Um, next, we'll have uh, Senator Jen Jordan introduce herself. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate being here. Um, my name is Jen Jordan. Um, I am an attorney when I'm not in the legislature and I do a lot of courtroom work. So uh, communicating and ideas and messaging are really important. Um, and also to be able to take really complex ideas. A lot of times court cases involve science and um, medicine and really kind of complex ideas and um, principles and being able to take some really complex stuff and being able to talk about it in a way that any person um, can kind of, you know, digest and understand is one of the most important things that you can do um, as a lawyer. And I know a lot of folks think that maybe lawyers, um, they don't really think about lawyers and science that much, but there are actually um, areas of the law where there, you have to have specific expertise in science. For example, patent lawyers. Um, you, you normally have to have a degree from a place like Georgia Tech, um, have to have a scientific background, um, and then a law degree in order to do that really, really specialized area. So one of the big things that, um, that I've really been focused on and working on the last few years and that I hear from a lot of constituents, especially young people, 
um, are about environmental concerns. Um, I get letters all the time about different ideas for bills um, and what you know, young people really want to see done in their communities. Um, whether you're talking about clean air, clean water, recycling or the like, that seems to be the one thing that, um, that you know, probably 18 and under seem to be the most concerned about. Um, and so because of that, it really has become a focus of mine. Um, and so I just really appreciate being here and um, look forward to answering questions. So thank you so much, Senator Jordan. All right, uh, we'll go to Representative Eric Allen. Good afternoon and thank you uh, for having me. I am Eric Allen, I represent House District 40, um, which is north of Atlanta as well, uh, Cobb and Fulton County, uh, mostly uh, Vinings, uh, Smyrna, North Buckhead area. And um, when I'm not in the legislature, I am a consultant and administrator in healthcare. Uh, been in that field for about 24 years, uh, really enjoy it. So although I am not on the science side, the patient delivery side, like uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, um, I enjoy supporting uh, doctors, nurses, paraprofessionals, and in working with others to make them well. Uh, and so, uh, so that's what I'm doing when I'm not in session. And uh, sim similar to uh, Senator Jordan, um, you know, a lot of the uh, outreach that I've received lately have been around uh, environmental issues. But I will tell you, over the last year, especially with young people, I've been very energized by the amount of people that have reached out about social justice and equity issues. Um, I think the the younger constituents are far more engaged on the issue, are, are closer to it, and just hearing their stories and spending time with them over the last year has been extremely invigorating. And uh, I, I just look forward to what this next generation does that we couldn't accomplish. So thank you for having me. I look forward to the questions. All right. All right. Um, that's great. Thank you for saying that. Um, it's also kind of sad to realize that I'm no longer the young generation. So at some point, we all reach that point. Uh, it, it, it's how you are at heart. If you're young at heart, it's all good. It's okay. <laughs> I am young at heart. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, and then finally, uh, we have Representative Jasmine Clark. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for having this forum and allowing me to participate in this forum. I do apologize for my lack of formal wear. I'm pulling double duty right now, and my daughter is at a track meet. So I uh, did not want to miss this opportunity. Um, and so I'm, you know, kind of trying to do both. So I didn't want to show up to a track meet dressed in, uh, you know, business casual that people wouldn't understand. So um, that said, my name is uh, Representative Jasmine Clark. I represent Georgia's House District 108, which is in Gwinnett County and encompasses the city of Lilburn and surrounding areas of Norcross, Stone Mountain, Tucker, and Lawrenceville. Um, I am a uh, microbiologist and lecturer at Emory University in my free time. And I um, and then I also really enjoy working as a state legislator. Um, I was elected in 2018, so this is my second term, but my third year, and I learn something new every day. Um, I appreciate uh, this forum, um, uh, Science for Georgia and March for Science, which I directed in 2017, um, have uh, you know very interesting stories. So uh, or as far as uh, being uh, kind of one born from the other. And so I'm really excited and it's exciting to see a familiar faces uh, on this panel today as well. Um, so when it comes to interactions with constituents, uh, that's probably one of my favorite parts of this job. Um, I really do enjoy hearing from my constituents, hearing about things that are important to them and engaging them. Um, and one of the things I really enjoy doing, similar to uh, Senator Jordan and uh, Representative Allen, as I really enjoy engaging my students in my district. Um, and so the high school students uh, at Perfue High School, but also at other uh, high schools, including Meadow Creek High School, um, I make it a point to engage with them, talk to them about issues that are important to them. And so they have come to me with uh, bills that uh, you know have to do with common sense gun legislation uh, because uh, not just because they have, um, you know, a, a fear of mass shootings and things like that, but also they're tired of losing their friends to things like suicide. 
Um, I also have engaged students when it comes to mental health days and um, trying to ensure that the mental health um, and the mental wellness of our students are being um, or is being uh, thought about uh, when we make uh, policy decisions. And uh, one other thing that uh, my students have been really interested in, and these are the Meadow Creek students uh, and uh, Senator Kirkpatrick will like this, uh, they are also thinking about vaping and how to uh, prevent their classmates from going down that uh, pathway of, uh, you know, starting to use vapes. And so we've been talking a lot about the legislative process and, you know, uh, types of legislation that they might be interested in as far as preventing vaping among their peers. And so, uh, again, thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to the discussion today. All right. Thank you so much. Um, this is really great to hear um, about how all y'all stay involved in the great ways you talk to your constituents. Um, so I guess we'll start off with a pretty, um, the most straightforward question is, what is the best way to reach out to your representative or senator? And then what sort of information do y'all need in that contact to then have the interaction be meaningful? Um, I'll start with Senator Kirkpatrick and then the rest of y'all can jump in. Okay, well, um, I'll start by saying that most of us, I think, pay a special attention to people that are our constituents in our district. And so if you put your zip code on there along with your name, that's a big help in sorting that out because on some issues we get a lot of communication and it can be from anywhere in the state or anywhere in the country. But there are also issues that are specific to, um, for example, health and human services. And I do try to pay attention to people who are, have expertise in that area who have an opinion. To me, the least effective way to communicate is by um, blast emails. I think personal emails are much more effective. And then phone calls are great too, except our voicemails, I just learned this this week, only hold 17 calls. And so if you're being bombarded on calls on any certain issue, it takes about five minutes for your voicemail to fill up. And we don't have a lot of staff sitting around down there. So it's hard to keep the voicemails, um, to keep track of all that and certainly impossible to call everybody back. So my thing that I would recommend to you is in the off season to try to develop a relationship, even if it's by email with your legislators, which means you got to know who they are. And you can find that out on openstates.org. But I think all of us are happy to meet with the constituents. We can't really do it so much live right now. Zoom works pretty well. Phone works pretty well. And if you want to meet about a specific issue, um, the most effective emails in my inbox have the subject matter and the subject line, bill number if possible, and then a very concise explanation about why you're for or against the bill. And if you need a meeting to request it. But uh, where you live does matter because uh, there, there are people from all over the state who are trying to sort things out. Thanks. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add to, to the one thing to what Dr. Kirkpatrick said, because that was a very good overview of, of the, the best way to contact. But one thing that I, I thoroughly enjoy, and I've noticed that younger constituents do it more so than others, but personal letters. Um, those are, are extremely compelling to get and they slow you down and, and kind of almost force you to read them. Um, so I, I would just recommend if you've got the time on an issue and you really want to get your legislator's attention, take the time and write a letter uh, and mail it to either the Capitol office or to their uh, district office if they have one. And I, I can tell you all of those letters that I get, I, I read those more so than skimming through the flood of inbox emails that come in, especially as Dr. Kirkpatrick said, a lot of those templatized uh, emails where you, you kind of already see the, the gist of where it's going and you can kind of kind of move it along. So I would, the only thing I would add is just if you can write a handwritten letter, that's always a great touch. Yeah, and I want to concur 100%. Um, we get thousands of emails, so it's really easy to um, overlook an email that's really important um, just because maybe 200 have come in at the same time. Um, but man, if I get, if you go old school and do just a handwritten letter, 
um, I always make sure that I respond to those in writing and um, and it really makes a difference because I, I know that it takes a lot more time and effort um, for somebody to do that. Um, and you can always be creative too, in terms of, of, of what you say and, and how you present your argument. Um, and then I, all of my colleagues have pretty much covered it, but I would also say, I actually like to get postcards too. Um, the interesting thing about a postcard is that um, it's quick. I don't have to open an envelope or anything like that. I can, you know, look at it. I see it. And, um, you know, that it, it's also easy for me to count if I get a bunch of postcards about the same issue. Um, I will also, I, I love what Senator Kirkpatrick said about staff. I think sometimes uh, constituents think that we're working on the same level and with the same amount of staff as they do in Washington, D.C., and at the state level, we are not. So if you're reaching out to your state legislator, understand that likely, if you do get a response, they are the one responding. There is not some staffer that's responding. Now, some do have staffers that uh, respond, but a lot of times we are seeing our emails. We are answering our voicemails. We are seeing those letters ourselves with our own eyes. And so it sometimes might take a little bit more time but do know that, you know, it's, it's a little bit more of an intimate um, interaction than what you might get at the federal level where uh, there are several layers before something would get in front of the person that you uh, addressed your letter to. Awesome. Thank you. That was super great. And, um, um, Okay, so now we're gonna switch a little bit of gears to science. Um, we had someone write in and ask, how do legislators in Georgia receive information for topics that require scientific expertise? And how do they know if they need to reach out and get scientific expertise? Um, and is there a process for identifying this need? Um, I'm gonna pick um, up. If you want, I can uh, jump in if that, if that is helpful. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I think uh, one of the things that, and for some context, um, we just had crossover day on Monday of this week, and crossover day is the day where all the bills must pass out of one chamber, or not all the bills, but a bill must pass out of one chamber and then cross over to the other chamber on the other side of the Capitol, and then that chamber has to uh, go through the same process that the bill went through in your chamber. So if it started in the House, it's got to cross over to the Senate. If it's in the Senate, it's got to cross over to the House. Um, and on, by that day, um, approximately 300-ish bills crossed over. Um, and so uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of bills and it's a lot of information. And um, even the most well-intentioned legislator is going to have a hard time being an expert on 300 separate bills. And so I think um, we uh, actually rely on people to keep us in the know and let us know what's in a bill and how it may affect them. And so if there's a bill that's coming through the pipeline that is um, important to you, that reaching out to us is actually helpful to us because a lot of times it might slip under the radar because again, it's embedded within hundreds of other bills. Um, and then as far as scientific expertise, um, I do think that as these bills are going through, um, we would hope that the sponsors of the bills have reached out to experts on the matter. But if you or someone you know is a subject matter, ex subject matter expert, you have the ability to speak in committee when those bills are heard in committee and you know, write a statement and present that statement in the committee hearings um, and let people know who you are and why they should trust what you say. So you know, the democratic process is not one of these processes where it's only the 256, uh, 236, sorry, trying to do some quick math. It's not just us that are going through this process we really do rely on people um, to make sure we have the right information, to let us know what's coming through. And if we are doing something wrong, we wanna hear from you. So um, I, I do think 
um, it's a collaborative process, it's a cooperative process, and it's a process where the citizens really have an opportunity to uh, give input. Um, if I could just add to that, I totally agree that you can't be a subject matter expert on everything, and that to some degree we do rely on each other. Um, I don't know a whole lot about banking, for example, but I got colleagues who do. And um, I keep a spreadsheet because it's really hard if you find out about a bill when you're about to vote on it and you haven't been tracking it through the process. And you can go back and watch the committee testimony, even if you can't be at the meeting on bills that you're interested in. So I've got categories for bills I'm carrying, sponsoring, interested in, and whatever, and uh, try to keep track of those. We've got a pretty robust research department in the Senate which is very helpful. I lean on them quite a bit. And also there's some national organizations that provide us with information. There's a national conference of state legislators, for example, that has a lot of background on things. So we do have ways, but everybody's an expert in something and nobody's an expert in anything. Yeah, also, I'll, I'll add that, hold on there. Let me okay, slide go ahead, in go here ahead. real quick. Go ahead. <laughs> Also, various groups, like, for example, doctors, um, nurses, um, have lobbyists that are up at the Capitol for them. And they really are watching lawyers, whatever. They're watching the various bills. And so if there is a bill that affects um, surgeons, for example, hand surgeons, whatever it is, right? They make sure that they have somebody from that profession come up and testify if it's necessary. They really try to be um, there to kind of serve as a, a resource for legislators who are passing legislation in a certain area that affects um, kind of their constituency, if you will. And so really um, lobbyists can, can be really helpful in that respect and making sure that the, the, the experts who really know what they're talking about um, actually show up at these committee hearings um, and, and give testimony and make sure that the legislature, legislators know exactly what they're doing whenever they're passing a bill. Yeah, and I, I, Senator Jordan hit on exactly what I was gonna talk about, the all-powerful uh, hand surgeon lobby uh, and, the, and the lobbyists <laughs> that, that help educate us uh, at the Capitol. But the, the other thing I would say is that the Senate and the House are probably some of the most diverse groups of people you could ever think of being thrown together. and. We all know our colleagues that specialize in certain things. And so when those bills or, or things come at us and they're, they're moving really fast, we, we, we all have our own networks of people that we know we can reach into internally within the chambers or externally with lobbyists, advocacy groups, uh, others. So it's a, it's a very complex process, but it's also a lot of resources that are available um, if, if you seek them out. Um, thanks. Um, um, yeah, that was um, what's interesting about all this is when I first started learning about government, right, people always gave lobbyists a bad name, but then a lot of people point out that lobbyists are providing a lot of in information. So you, you do, they do provide a lot of information. Um, so several of you mentioned, you know, testifying before committees. And I, I think this is a thing that most people in our audience did not think that they as mere mortals can do. So can someone explain to us the process of how one would come testify before a committee? Go, go ahead, Jen. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a little bit different with COVID um, because normally there are tons of people up at the Capitol. I mean, mm -hmm. tons, groups of people, uh, groups of doctors, whatever it is every profession, scientists you can think of, groups. I mean, uh, there's like dentist day and uh, podiatrist day and all these things. And so there are always people up there. Um, and so what happens is you can trace bills um, as was talked about earlier, and you can see when it's gonna be heard in a committee. And really all you have to do is you have to just show up that day. They tell you exactly where to go, it's, it's public. Um, to the committee room, and a lot of times they will have a public sign up um, for, for people from the public to sign in and say, you know, I want to comment on this bill. Um, you don't have to necessarily have any expertise. Um, I know one guy who comes to every judiciary committee meeting and, and just 
just gives his 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 thoughts on every single bill. And he's not a lawyer or anything, but he but he comes down there every meeting and he tells the committee what he thinks about it. Um, there really isn't a limitation other than you just have to show up, you have to sign up, um, and then you kind of, you know, you tell the committee um, what you think. Like I said, COVID has stopped that, a lot of that this year, um, but, you know, fingers crossed that by the time we get to session next year, we're going to be in a different place and hopefully we're going to be able to have, um, you know, robust public um, hearings again. Hey, I'll just add to that. Uh, I know who that guy is, Jen, and uh, he actually is a pretty smart guy. And he <laughs> really knows what he's talking about. But um, anyway, I was just going to say that this year, a lot of the committees are accommodating Zoom testimony or call-in testimony, and that's at the discretion of the chairman. And uh, because near the end of the session, we're operating under pretty tight time constraints, it can be um, difficult to give everybody as much time as they want. So sometimes the chairman will limit the testimony to just a couple minutes to get as many people heard as possible. But the chair of the committee um, frequently will accommodate uh, virtual testimony, which it, actually I think that will probably continue to be a tool that we use even after COVID. Um, Representative Allen, did you have anything to add? No, that, that was all well stated. All right. Hey, um, can I add just one um, thing? And, and that is that sometimes the, the process of actually presenting a committee, you got to really know when to show up. And I, I think one of the things that people have to uh, or struggle with is just knowing when is it. I didn't know when the bill was going to get a hearing. And, you know, honestly, I work there and sometimes I don't even know when a bill is going to get a hearing. Uh, but one of the things I would say that might uh, help with that part of the process is number one, looking at what committee that bill has been assigned to. And then following that committee and looking at the agendas for that committee to see if the bill is on an upcoming agenda. Now, sometimes the agenda just says TBA and we don't get an updated agenda until that day. So it can be a little bit harder. Um, and so another tool that you can use or another tool in your toolbox can be to, if it's a bill that is off, that is followed by a particular interest group. So let's say um, we can stick with hand surgeons and there's a hand surgeon bill. Um, hand Surgeons of America probably will let you all know, you know, House Bill 557, which will do this for hand surgeons or will be bad for hand surgeons is being heard today at two o'clock p.m. in room such and such. You should show up there. Um, and so, you know, it, again, I always think of uh, democracy as very collaborative and not reinventing the wheel necessarily every single time. And so, yes, you can try to track bills on your own and a lot of people do, but a lot of times groups will, you know, give you that information. They'll, they'll send you an email that says, this is being heard, uh, um, contact your legislator today, you know, about this bill, but uh, know that you can also show up to the Capitol or reach out to the chair of that committee and ask to be signed up to speak um, via Zoom. Cool. All right, that was super helpful. Thank you. Um, um, okay, so the next question came from someone who is 12 and she asks, as a Georgia middle schooler not eligible to vote yet, what kinds of action and advocacy can I take part in? Um, I'll, I'll jump in on, on that one because I have an answer I love to give to, uh, to young people on this question. The best advocacy you can do um, sometimes is in your own home. Um, advocating to your parents <laughs> uh, who are voters, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, um, that matters um, because you have a voice in, in, in your family and you can advocate to people in a, in a way that I couldn't uh, or, or other advocacy groups couldn't. So I, I always tell young people, the first place of advocacy be to make sure that your parents know where you fall or what, what's important to you, uh, what those issues are. Um, and then work your way outward toward um, 
you know, toward the legislators, but it's kind of been a common theme. Also find groups of interest um, that share the same thoughts or, or, or emotions that you do about an issue uh, and, and start following um, their newsletters, um, you know, going to their meetings or having those conversations. Um, we met, someone mentioned Girl Scouts earlier. You don't think about Girl Scouts as an advocacy group, but a lot of ideas, they feed on each other within those, those groups of interest. Um, so advocate to your parents. That's always a good place to start. Find communities of interest uh, that you can associate with and then track those uh, newsletters and communications like Dr. Clark said, said earlier. And just to, just to kind of piggyback on what Eric was saying, look, I think we know the power of young people and especially how they're able to use various types of social media. I mean, for example, TikTok, the average user is 12 years old, right? My daughter's 12, lots of TikTok in my house. But what we saw with the U.S. Senate races is that John Ossoff was like all over TikTok, right? And so people would say, well, those aren't voters. Like, why is he wasting his time and his money and his energy on that? But what he knew is what Representative Allen said, which is, look, young people are engaged. Um, they know what they think. They know their minds. And they really are some of the best advocates out there. So while Ossoff is, is doing his TikToks and the 12-year-olds are watching it, the 12-year-olds are then showing their parents um, and talking about how great John Ossoff is. And so it really is just a different medium um, to really reach folks um, kind of where they are, which is the 12 year olds TikTok. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll second um, the idea of talking with your parents if you're a young person. My kids are older, they're 27 and 28, but we don't agree on a lot of stuff, but we always agree that it, about taking responsibility for your actions and frequently they have well thought out arguments and we're not afraid to have open conversations. And uh, I hope that kids can have that type of open discussion with their families. The other thing I would say is it's very important to understand how our system works and uh, civics education, super important. I know Senator Jordan's had some bills on this before, because if you don't understand separation of powers and kind of how our legislature works, it's very tough for you to engage. So I think our website is helpful. It's legis.ga.gov. And you can track legislation on there by keyword, or if you know the bill number, you can find your representatives, you can find committees and what they're discussing, and you can actually reach out to your representatives through the website. So. I think that's a great tool too, no matter what your age. And um, I know in Gwinnett County, we have opportunities for youth to engage. Um, for example, we have the Gwinnett Youth Commission, which is more so high school, but you know, I think these types of initiatives um, acknowledge that the youth are our future and the, the issues that we are voting on today actually do affect them they are going to be the recipients of what we do today. And so uh, opportunities to engage in things like that, uh, youth commission, um, you know, uh, things like Girl Scouts and uh, Scouts. And we, I mean, I know I've spoken to many Scouts groups, um, you know, as a, as a legislator. Um, you know, these are the types of things where it, it, one of the things it does, even though you may not, be uh, a voter, it does give, it helps to give direction to legislators um, of, of what's important, what's coming up. Uh, you know, environmental issues are really important to young people because what we do today with our environment, they will inherit. And so, you know, I, I, I appreciate this 12 year old's question. I have a 12 year old daughter myself. And so, um, you know, I appreciate that they're, they're thinking about these things. And so, yeah, try to get engaged in some of those youth opportunities as well, along with, again, advocating to your parents um, and any adults that will, that will listen because, I mean, you know, y'all are the future. And if I can, Amy, I'd like to add one thing. If you're, if you're 12, we couldn't do it this year because of COVID, but consider being a page. Um, that, that is, we, I think all of us can say we miss that energy so much around the Capitol. 
this year. It, it just brings a totally different energy to have the pages and the school field trips and, and everything else. But if you really want to see the process up close, reach out to your legislator at, you know, next year. I'm hoping we have them next year. Uh, and just ask them to be a page for a day. Uh, you get an excused absence from school, you get Chick-fil-A for lunch, and you get to walk on the, the Senate and the House floor and, and interact with, with legislators. So it's a really good way to really get the feel of the, the process and the experience. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I would add that, um, I mean, I've had like 10 year debates with my parents over controversial issues, but after times, right, like it slowly, they finally came around to my way of being. And, you know, I started when I was eight working on them. And so, yeah, it's definitely, you know, start early and uh, bug your parents often and it works. Um, so, um, multiple, you guys multiple times brought up like, um, uh, you know, how the general assembly works. And I think, uh, this, this is probably a basic question, but something we're probably all confused about is, you know, what powers does the Georgia general assembly have and, and how does that different from like the U S Congress and what should people be talking to you about and what should be people, people be writing their U S representative about? I'll take a crack at that, that one. Um, first of all, we do two things. It's three things at the state level. One is we are accountable for the budget. And so following the money is very important because uh, that's where the action takes place. And then we also pass legislation as we've discussed, but we also do constituent services. And one of the things that we can help with is helping people navigate state government. A great example this year is the Department of Labor, which has been a big challenge for many people. And I'm not sure that we, uh, how much of an impact we have on that, but we at least try. And that's a very appropriate thing for us to get involved with. Um, I would also have to say that we're much more functional at the state level than the federal government is at times. And I think it's hard for people to always understand that some things are local, some things are county level issues or city level issues. Some things are state level and some things are federal. And uh, all of us get emails all the time that kind of have that mixed up. So we try to point people in the right direction. Right. Yeah, it's kind of complicated, I mean, because that's like a whole year of law school, you know, talking about <laughs> federal jurisdiction versus state jurisdiction <laughs> versus municipalities versus counties, all this kind of stuff. Um, but really, if you kind of think about it from the perspective of if there is a law that is going to affect people outside of Georgia, then that's at the federal level, right? If it's a law that just is going to affect or, or, or something that's just going to affect the people in the state, then that's probably a state issue. Um, and also, you can even boil it down even more and say, okay, let's say you want your pot, there's a pothole in front of your house and you want that filled, right? that only affects your city, right? Or your county. And so that's kind of how you can, you can keep boiling it down to, the, to whom then you need to reach out to. Because if you reach out to me to fill a pothole, that's not probably, it won't happen. <laughs> but if you reach out to your city council person, um, they're the appropriate person to go to, um, to deal with that issue. So you kind of have to think about it a little bit like, how big is this problem? Who does it affect? And, and how broad is it? And then that can kind of bring you to, to probably what level of government you should, you should contact. Excellent. Um, all right. Um, um, ooh, I have so many great questions to choose from. Um, so I would say the one of the ones that's important to all of us. So what are some recent examples of public campaigns uh, changing legislative outcomes here in Georgia? And how and how did how did they become a positive outcome? Social justice, right? Like okay. the House just repealed the citizens arrest um, statute that's been on the books since uh, slavery. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. and then last year we passed um, the hate crimes bill, which we have been trying to pass for years and years and years. And that really came about uh, because of people who really had had enough and wanted change. Um, and so it's kind of like what Representative Allen was talking about in terms of social justice issues. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I would I would add that sometimes within advocacy, and I I, I struggle with this as an advocate as well, but it's not always about the, the straight up win and loss. Um, bills are imperfect documents, and sometimes advocacy makes them better. So you may not always get everything you want, but that advocacy can really move the needle. So when you're when you're looking at it in terms of legislation, it's not necessarily a, a an either or. It's kind of a both end uh, because you can always influence through the process, through the committee process, through people are always listening. You know, I, I tell people with, with feedback, don't don't judge feedback on the action that's taken, but the way it's received, because people may not always act on it, but they hear it. And it'll make very small changes in the legislation sometimes that you may not even see, you know, or feel, but it does have an impact. So that advocacy is very important, but I see people get burned out because they look at it in a linear win-loss type of narrative, and it's just so much more complex. I 100% agree with that. And I think frequently we take baby steps uh, in the legislature. Sometimes that's the best way to do it, actually. But um, I've got a big bill I'm working on right now that I'm going to be talking to Representative Allen about um, that has to do with the outcry that I've heard from patients and doctors about the hassles that they have getting approval for procedures from insurance companies. And uh, I've been working on that bill for several months and got it through the Senate, but now the industry that's affected by it is uh, getting engaged. And I am now on version number 15 of that bill. And I promised I would work with the stakeholders and keep trying to make changes. And it's not gonna be everything that everybody wants. In fact, if everybody's equally unhappy with it, it's probably a pretty good bill. <laughs> We've seen that before. I don't know if my colleagues would agree with that, but I think uh, keeping the football moving down the field is what we're trying to do. Right. And I would say the same thing for environmental issues. Um, I feel like, um, you know, it was not to, it was not long ago where I was told that Georgia does not have enough sun for solar. Literally, I was told that. And I'm like, have you been below the net line in Georgia? We've got enough sun. We just need to have the political will to you know move in that direction and now the now the narrative is georgia is leading in solar we are top five in solar production uh or solar use of use of uh solar energy um in the country and you know that shift um it happened over time um but it it came from advocacy and it came from people who tend to, to care about these issues and didn't let up. Um, and so uh, I, uh, I echo what Senator Kirkpatrick said, things don't always move as fast as you want them to move, but just because they're not moving fast does not mean they're not moving. And sometimes you get the, you know, uh, I'll use a football reference. Sometimes you get the 60 yard pass all the way down the field and get a touchdown. And sometimes you just go down by down. And that's what we, in some, you know, that's how it goes. And so don't get discouraged necessarily if things aren't moving fast. Um, but if you are speaking to people and you are making your case, trust that someone is listening. And it eventually, sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's like a quick pivot, and sometimes it's a very slow progression, but it eventually happens. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Yeah, that's that's been a thing to learn that, um, you know, it, it's a long game, right? It's incremental change and just keep moving the football forward. Uh, I also love that we live in the South so I can continuously make football analogies and people understand them. So that that was a big change from where I grew up. Um, so thank you for that. So um, we're nearing the end. So I just have one final question from our scientists in the audience. Uh, they really want to understand if there's anything we're doing to move the needle towards um, more innovation spaces for students um, or a uh, lab space for students? Um, I'll go back to something I already touched on, which is all of this goes back to the budget. And uh, sometimes legislation is needed, but you know, the Bible says where your treasure, where your heart is, is where your treasure is or something like that. 
because uh, priorities um, show up in the budget because unlike the federal government, we, we balance our budget. And so if things go to one program, they come out of another program. We spend a lot of our money on healthcare and on education. And so there are lots of line items in those spaces. So I think the budget is a very good place and people don't realize they can advocate for budget items, not just legislation. And there are appropriations subcommittees that address all these issues and the members are very likely to listen to appeals for uh, certain items in the budget. So I think that's overlooked sometimes as a way to make a difference in our process. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think uh, in the last uh, couple of budgets that we voted on, I have had uh, groups come to me. Um, I've had a college in my district come to me and say, we're trying to get this particular building and this we will do this and this and this for our students. Um, I also know that there has been a particular focus in filling high demand, high paying jobs um, in our state. And uh, a lot of that comes down to training. And if the training is gonna happen, then we need the facilities for training. Um, I work in the nursing space and I know that we have some amazing nursing simulation labs around our state because you know uh, people are advocating for those dollars. And you know it's not always gonna be just state money. Usually it's a mixture of public money and private money. But altogether, um, you know, these are things that are on people's minds. And so if there's something in particular that a person is uh, wants to see happen, uh, they should definitely reach out um, to their legislator and, uh, you know, uh, reach out about the appropriation process and see if there's anything that can be done in that space if possible. Um, because we're always looking for ways to innovate and we're always looking for ways to make Georgia make Georgia better, um, and also to fill these very high demand jobs right now um, that, you know, companies are saying you need people, but you got to train them. And so that's really important. Yeah, it, and, and this question is a really good question. It's kind of a loaded one, too, because there are so many different areas where funds come from for these types of things. Um, I think it was either uh, one of the senators earlier talked about the different layers of government and how things work. I mean, I would even throw, as, as Dr. Clark said, that private layer uh, in there, because when you look at these things, a lot of them are funded uh, through local school boards and their budgets. Uh, they're able to get grants and different things to, uh, to facilitate this. You have quasi-government entities like Invest Atlanta or, you know, here in Cobb County, we have Select Cobb. You have different things where they can bring in some, some partnership money. Um, you know, Georgia is very rich in the amount of uh, you know, fortune companies that we have from Home Depot, Coca-Cola, everybody, they're always looking at ways that they can reinvest in the education and access to, to the sciences. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of different ways. What, what I will say is your legislator can also be an advocate for you. Uh, and if you have those ideas, it's not a bad place to start to reach out to, to your legislator and say, here, here's what I'm thinking. Can you just help me find the right resource that can, can bring this to fruition? Um, so it's a it's a good question, very complex answer. Um, but the good thing is, you do have certain places you can you can start with, and I, I firmly believe that advocating at your local school board level is a great first place to start, uh, because they can also figure out where those resources are to get what you need or want. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, Wow, so this has been a really lively, wonderful discussion. I really appreciate all your answers. Um, so uh, our, our time here is up. So I wanna thank uh, Senator Kirkpatrick, Senator Jordan, uh, Representative Allen and Representative Clark for joining us. This has been great. Um, two of you are my uh, actual representatives in the, in the Georgia legislature. So thanks. And um, you guys have all been wonderful friends of Science for Georgia. So thank you again for that. Uh, to the audience, um, we did record this, so it, the link will be up on our YouTube channel soon. And we did promise you all a postcard. So as they said, a handwritten postcard is more um, impactful. So um, y'all can expect some amazing postcards from our studio audience today. 
Um, but I really want to thank everyone for joining. Um, uh, oh, uh, Sarah sent us a survey from um, Atlanta Science Festival. So we will be sending that out as well for everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And y'all have a great Saturday and everyone get their COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm.